my goodness gracious, Oda, 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 what are you doing to me, man? What are you doing to me? Ah, just when you think you got everything figured out in One Piece, just when you think you're the One Piece encyclopedia and you got all the factions of this story locked down on the chessboard, right? We got the Marines, you know, the Admirals and everybody. You got the Warlords, you got the Yonko, you got the Straw Hats, who are Yonko? You got the rest of the Supernovas, right? Uh, you got the Revolutionaries, you got the Tenderubito, you got Cypher Pool Zero, you got all of the pieces on the chessboard, and now it's time for the final saga. And you're looking at all these pieces and you're trying to figure out how they're gonna move and, you know, who's gonna take which, uh, piece and everything like that, and then right when you think it's all gonna be settled, BOOM! Oda introduces the new DLC in chess. The new piece. Um, what would it be called? What's a cooler version of knight? Uh, Dreadnought. Yeah, it goes pawn, bishop, rook, uh, uh, knight, queen, king, and now introducing the new chess DLC. The Dreadnought. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've been saying for a while there needs to be a chess too. I, it's been forever. It's literally been hundreds of years, can we please get a chest 2 already? The sequel that everybody has been asking for. Oh my goodness, alright, so we got the God's Knights, and oh my goodness, you know, I really thought the God's Knights, because they were mentioned before a few times, I thought they were just going to be like a judiciary body of the Tenerubito that settle petty arguments between them. I, I didn't think it was actually going to be like a fighting force that we had to be worried about. And the reason for that, it was just like, you know, we're entering the final saga. You know, Oda had a thousand chapters to build up all these other groups. You know, now some of the groups had more development than others, sure. Obviously, mo most of the focus here is going to be on the pirates. Um, but we've had a fair amount of development in the Revolutionary Army in the last, you know, hundred or so chapters, you know, with the Reverie and everything, with Sabo building that up. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if the whole reason, well, maybe one of the reasons why Oda planned on, like, you know, having Sabo survive the attack when he was a kid and become a member of the Revolutionaries is to sort of, sort of give us a stake in the Revolutionary Army so then we could focus on them a little bit more, like, oh, Sabo. Sabo's involved now, right? Uh, because we didn't really spend a lot of time with Dragon before that, and I guess he could have just thrown Koala at us or whatever and just been like, oh, Koala, remember her from Fisher Tiger's backstory? We're gonna follow her adventure now. So, it was a pretty smart move of Oda to, you know, not only have Sabo still alive, but also a member of the Revolutionary, so, like, connected us to that group now. And we've learned a lot about them, you know, in just the past hundred chapters or so since Reverie. Oh, actually, over Reverie. We're up like 1,080 right now, so getting close to 200 chapters since Reverie. Oh, my God. It's a lot of time has passed. Okay, but, you know, all of a sudden, God's Knights, right? And um, I've been reading comments, a lot of comments, a lot of thoughts about what the God's Knights really are going to be in terms of power level. And uh, I've seen a fair amount of people that are actually suggesting that there's going to be a twist of the God's Knights in that they're not really strong, or it might be kind of a buggy sort of situation where we're hyping up the God's Knights as these really powerful force to be reckoned with of the Tenerubito, and then it turns out they're just like a bunch of pompous, pretentious Tenerubito wearing fancy armor, and they're just like, oh, yes, I am a member of the God's Knights. My sword is made of solid silver. How about yours? Oh, well, my sword is made of solid gold. How about yours? My sword is made of solid diamond. <laughs> you know, like, they wear, like, super shiny armor that has never seen a day of battle in its life. It's, like, polished to, like, a mere g gaze, but beyond that, it's just nothing. It's all up here and nothing more. Uh, it's just bluster and bravado, and that's what the God's Knights are. And you know what? Like, I could see Oda tackling that. Like, I could see him going that direction and having it be funny, but I really don't think that's the case. For one thing, we kind of already am do are doing that with Buggy, but also, Dragon seemed genuinely concerned about the God's Knights, all right? So here's my first question. I mean, I have a lot of questions, and we're not even going to get to all of them in this video. I mean, Shanks is a big part of this, and I don't even know if we're going to really address the Shanks stuff here. But, um, you know, Shanks' brother might be a member of the God's Knights. Shanks might have a twin brother, okay? The person that we saw meeting the Gorosei at the Reverie that was wearing the cloak. Um, a lot of other YouTubers have already talked about this, but to boil it down, they were wearing a cloak, so we didn't get to see if they were missing an arm, and also, the manga and the anime made it a point to only show the side of the person's face that, you know, like the, the I guess it would be the right side of Shanks' face right here, the side that doesn't have the scar. We did not see the other side of this individual's face. So I think it was actually another member of the Figarland family that Shanks is most likely part of, and it's Shanks' twin brother or something like that. So, 
that's that's a popular theory right now. But beyond that, that wasn't the main question I wanted to ask. Um, the awareness of the rest of the world on if the God God's Knights exist. That was my first question. Like the regular citizens of the One Piece world, do they know they exist? And I, I have a feeling like they don't. I feel like the God's Knights are really the last resort of the Tenrubito. They are the fighting force that must always remain, or at least like a majority of them must remain at Marijua at all times in case of like worst worst case scenario, somebody attacks Marijua. Somebody really strong or like the Iron Giant or somebody attacks Marijua and the Holy Knights or the God's Knights must remain there at all times. So I think they're stronger than Cypher Pole Zero. Cypher Pole Zero are the personal bodyguards of the Tenerubito for most tasks, and they also are still an intelligence gathering organization that go out into the world. And we saw that with Cypher Pole going to Wano and, you know, and Dress Rosa and retrieving information from those places. They still do all of that. And even with, you know, Lucci and Kaku and Stussy heading to Egghead to deal with Vegapunk. So that, that's quite, sort of the job of all of the Cypher Poles, but Cypher Pole Zero just being the highest echelon there. God's Knights are even more of an elite group where they really don't leave Marijua unless the... Okay. So, um, you know, unless something really bad happened, they would not deploy the God's Knights. In fact, I'm even kind of thinking that the Tenerubito know about their existence, but they don't even like to deal with them. You know what I mean? Like, the idea, the prospect of letting the God's Knights loose upon the world is actually kind of scary even to them. A lot of people have brought up the connection to the Gorosei, and, and there's a few directions you could take it with that. I saw one direction where the Gorosei, you know, they are taken from a select group of Tenerubito to become the Elders, right? And so what would happen to the other, uh, not, not the failures, but the ones that did not live up to the standards of becoming a Gorosei. So then the other one, sort of like a Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood situation with King Bradley, who was raised with a bunch of other orphans and basically trained to be the greatest warrior ever, and then given a Philosopher's Stone and who will become the leader of a Mestris. Like, that's basically King Bradley's backstory, kind of like that with the Tenerubito, where they gather some of the most promising Tenerubito together, and they train them, and the ones that are the best of the best, and not just fighting ability, but also just like intelligence and foresight and the ones that would make good Gorosei become Gorosei, what happens to the other ones? Well, the other ones become God's Knights. So I saw that perspective. I also saw that the Gorosei are essentially retired members of the God's Knights. So the God's Knights are all in their physical prime right now, like 30s, 40s, into their 50s, and they're truly a fighting force to be reckoned with, okay? But then when they get too old and they decide to retire, they become Gorosei, all right? And you can also have a thing where maybe the current generation of Gorosei trains God's Knights or something like that. Like That's one of the Gorosei's duties. Although we don't really see the Gorosei do much other than just hang out in the Room of Authority, and their couch of authority, and drink their uh, their delicious soda pop out of the fridge of authority. <laughs> Everything is of authority in uh, in the room of authority. And uh, I'm just talking like Cartman, but you know it's it's a fun word to say, right? Anyway. So, you know, I, I don't think it's like that, maybe exactly, but the whole idea of get, getting a bunch of Tenerubito together when they were children and training them up, kind of like they do with the Cypher Pole agents, where they just take a bunch of orphans off the street and train them to be Cypher Pole agents, like that with the Tenerubito, making them Gorosei and God's Knights, depending on, you know, their, their aptitude and what they're really good at and everything like that. I want to throw out, I want to throw out a scenario here. Okay, I'm gonna throw out a little bit of a hypothetical. Actually, it's part hypothetical, and the other part of this is a, g a genuine question about the story, because Oda has already now clarified there are a group called the God's Knights. We don't know much about them, but we know there's a group called the God's Knights. We know they reside in Marijua. We know they deal with internal affairs of the Tenerubito, because that was confirmed, because when Mjolsgaard struck Charlos, let the God's Knights handle it. That was, that was the rule that Akainu threw down. And uh, one of them resembles Shanks. We don't even, you know what? I'm going to take that off the table right now because that's not important. From what we know, God's Knights, Marijua, at least nine of them based on the shadows. And Dragon was fearful of them. Dragon at least was aware. So even if normal citizens in the world maybe don't know about them, this is Dragon. This is the chief of staff commander. No, no, Sabo's the chief of staff. Chief of staff sounds like the ruler. He's the, Dragon is the supreme commander, whatever. Supreme commander Dreadnought 
of the Revolutionary Army. So if his intel tells him that the God's Knights are fearful and you should worry about them and now they're going to be active because they attack the city directly, we should be afraid of them. At least I think we should be wary of them, right? So anyway, here's my hypothetical, okay? What would happen if a very powerful pirate, say a Yonko, decided to attack Marijua head on? For this hypothetical, let's use Kaido, because Kaido, we just got to see a lot of what Kaido's capable of during Wano. Also, he can turn into a dragon, and he can fly. What happens if Kaido decides one day, or he's just getting wicked plastered, and he's just like, Oh, no, no. oh man, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna... I'm gonna attack Marijua today. You know, Ka Kaido, sir, that's not a good idea. Shut up, you don't tell me what to do! Rawr, dragon mode, and he just goes for Marijua. He just goes for it, alright? He is wicked toasted, and he's just flying straight up the red line, and he's just gonna nuke Marijua, okay? So, what would happen in that scenario? Who would stop Kaido? Well, first thing you would probably throw out is the admirals, right? Okay. Well, well, let's think about this for a moment here. The admirals are not, I mean, sometimes they're at Marijua, you know, like Fujitora and Aramaki were there during Reverie, but that was during Reverie. So let's say this does not happen. So the admirals are not always hanging out at Marijua just waiting for a Yonko to attack. Usually they're down in Marine HQ. Um, typically, uh, sometimes they're scattered across the world depending on their mission, like when Fujitora got sent off to uh, Dressrosa. You know, they're, they're doing their individual things. Um, and, and, you know, like, what if, what, if, what if Kaido is able to just get up there before the admirals reach him? I, I mean, like, if the admirals are scattered all over the world, the, the one exception here is Kizaru, because he's made of light. So, in theory, you could say he could reach there. But then then again, Kizaru did take a ship when he went to Sabaody to, um, you know, attack the Straw Hats when Luffy punched Charlos. It it wasn't like Kizaru was like, oh, I will go deal with the Straw Hats, zip, and then went right over to Sabaody. So, so we're, I guess, assuming he can't do that, because he hasn't really shown to be able to do that in the story, to, like, zip across the planet whenever he wants. Um, let's say Kaido did it though. Let's let's say Kaido headed up the red line. The Marines see him, and they's like, "Oh, red alert! Red alert! Kaido's in full plaster dragon mode. He's heading for Marijua. Admirals, you gotta stop him." You know what I mean? I guess in theory, the fleet admiral that would where the uh, responsibility would lie there. Because the fleet admiral, like Sakazuki, would always be positioned at either Marine HQ or on um. Marijua in one of the other locations. Let's say he's at Marine HQ. And, uh, but, you know, let's say Kaido doesn't just go straight up. You know, let's say he goes around or whatever. Let, let's just say, okay, let's say Kaido reaches Marijua before the Admirals do. The Admirals are hot on his tail. They're coming for him. Like, Akainu turns into a magma jet, and he's heading up the red line. But let's say, let's say Kaido gets there first. He's a dragon. He's fast. He gets there, let's say, five minutes before Akainu or any of the Admirals get there. Boro Breath! Boom! Boro Breath! Boom! Just... Pangea Castle, gone. Temple of the Gods, gone. It would not take Kaido long to nuke that place, alright? If he gets there a couple minutes before the Admirals, that's gonna be a problem. So who's gonna stop him? Well, Cypherpole. Cypherpole's up there. Is Cypherpole Zero gonna be enough? Don't get me wrong, Luchi and Kaku, it was really cool seeing their awakened forms, and I was actually giving them a lot more credit on them when they were fighting Luffy. But, um, I, I don't know if Luchi's gonna be able to, like, block a Boro Breath, or a, a Dragon Twister, or when Kaido goes into his full Lava Dragon form, you, you know? I, I don't know if there's anything Luchi could really do about that. Um, the masked members of Cypher Pool Zero? Like, yeah, they're pretty strong, but, uh, you know, Kaido... BAM! <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so what I'm basically saying here, what I'm basically saying, in the worst case scenario, if a really strong threat reaches and breaches the, the gates of Marijua, a, a threat that Cypher Pole Zero alone could not deal with, who else up there could deal with them? That is where it makes sense to have a select group, the God's Knights, of nine tremendously powerful knights that are always on call 24 7 at marijua they never leave that place they stay there and their job is to train and keep their power level up and be ready in case something like that were to happen because you do not want to be caught with your pants down when drunk ass kaido 
barges into your hometown, all right? So, like, just, just, the, just the slight chance that could happen. You know, like, Kaido reaches Marijua, Admirals are not here yet, Cypher Pole can't stop them, it's game over. All the Tanribito would just die. It'd be just game over. There's nothing else they could do. Unless the Goros, say, turn out to be powerful. Oh, dude. Oh, dude, that would be cool, though. That, you know, Ka Kaido emerges, giant dragon, he's, like, looming over Castle Pangea, and he's like, whoa, 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 it's time I finished you off. And then he fires Boro Breath, and the five Goros, say, just emerge on top of the castle, and they're like, let's go, you know? You could say Eam. You, you, a lot of you might have been saying Eam. I should have addressed Eam earlier. Um, maybe Eam, sure, but we don't know anything about Eam. And would Eam, would Eam fight this battle themselves? Because Eam seems to be a rather hands-off, like, direct, like, doesn't really get involved very much. You know what I mean? Eam, if Eam is a deity, maybe Eam could just, like, wave their hand and then Kaido just disappears or just turns into a duck or, or something like that. Maybe. Sure, you could say that. But disregarding Eam for a moment because Eam is such a um, j just such a mystery factor in all this and we just have no idea Eam is such an unknown um, Cypher Pool Zero I feel could not hold back Kaido and maybe the Gorosei could if the Gorosei could really fight but then you start getting into like having a fighting force that would intercept Kaido and fight back against him alright that that makes more sense Somebody else I actually just realized that could maybe deal with this threat too that is based at Marijua is Kong, who is the former fleet admiral. He is the current commander-in-chief. Um, I, I could imagine Kong, like if the Gorosei are not fit for combat, if the Gorosei are really just politicians or just rulers and that's all they are, and if Eam doesn't want to get involved with all this and Cypher Pole Zero is not strong enough um, and the admirals have not arrived yet, um, then I suppose it would fall to Kong. Just by the idea of him being a former fleet admiral, just by that, I mean, he would be strong enough to deal with Kaido, but, you know, he's just one man. It, it really makes sense to have a whole fighting force organized, ready to go in case of this happening. Like, it just look at the scenario of like, oh, okay, if something attacks Marijua and the Admirals are not around and the Cypher Pool Zero can't deal with it, our trump card is... This old man with spiky hair who's probably pushing 80 at this point, if not older, he's going to be the one that's going to save the day. And it's like, it would make more sense to have a fighting force in their prime to deal with a threat like that. Kong versus Kaido would be epic to see. And, you know, Kong might actually be one of the first lines of defense before the God's Knights. You know, like, Dragon Kaido attacks, and he's drunk, and he's like, Ugh! And Cypher Pole Zero comes out, and Kong shows up, and he's like, All right, Cypher Pole, back up. You're not going to be strong enough to bring him down. All right, Kaido, time you sobered up, buddy. You don't tell me to sober up. You know what I mean? That's, yeah, I am sober. I'm not drunk like you. <laughs> you know, it's like something like that. Um, I, I could see that going down. I could see that going down, yeah. Now, that was the hypothetical. Moving on to the question I have that this arose to, how did Fisher Tiger get away with what he did? with the God's Knights being up there? That's a question. That's a genuine question. Now, the Iron Giant, kind of the same question. Like, how did the Iron Giant get away with it? But, like, the Iron Giant, from what we understand, st you know, scaled the walls and then began to attack and then immediately was like... Grrr. So maybe the overall damage the Iron Giant did wasn't that bad. It, it was a little scary. Maybe he torched a few buildings, but that was it. Uh, maybe the God's Knights, actually, that happened 200 years ago. That was a while ago. So maybe the God's Knights were formed in response to the Iron Giant attack because that kind of realized, like, oh, yes, we have the Marines, we have the Admirals, we have Cypher Pole Zero guarding the Tenrabito. We do not need any other fighting force. Oh, my God, a giant robot! Durr! You know, just like, oh, God, it's torching everything! You know, and then it powers down and just... Durr! It's like, all right, we need... um. We need an extra layer of security up here post-haste. You know, that actually might have been the case. So that happened 200 years ago. But the Fisher Tiger thing, that happened like 11 years ago, 12 years ago, something like that, where he was a slave, and then he escaped, and then he scaled the uh, red line again, and then freed all the slaves. So where were the God's Knights when that was happening? You know, I, I guess Fisher Tiger was just really quick. He just freed as many slaves as he could, set the town on fire, and then skipped out. For that matter, 
What were the God's Knights doing when Sabo and the revolutionaries were attacking? Okay. All right, all right. No, okay, okay. I do think the God's Knights are threatening. I, I don't think they're just like a bunch of wimps in a bunch of shiny armor and that's all they're there for, just like symbolic. No, they are, they are important. It does make sense, and we talked about this in the stream, what if the God's Knights are essentially the royal guards to the king, the king of the world, in this case being Im-sama, and they will only, only mobilize if Eam demands it. It is the only time they will do anything. If it was not the Garosei, not the other Tenrobito, not Kong, not Sakazuki, they only take their orders from a single person, and that is Eam. And Eam did not command them to attack when Fisher Tiger raided the city. He did not command them to attack when Sabo and the revolutionaries were literally burning the, the domain of the gods. Maybe because it wasn't directly affecting Eam. When Fisher Tiger broke in, he was just there to free slaves and burn some towns down. It wasn't directly affecting Eam. Um, when Sabo, Sabo, I mean, it was threatening the food stores and it was threatening the Tenrubito, but it wasn't directly affecting Eam at the moment. So maybe that's why he didn't move them. That maybe the God's Knights are... See, that's the thing. If we're going to go along with the logic that the man, Shanks' brother, I'll call him, Shanks' is, uh, is twin brother, when he was meeting with the Garosei, that seemed, if he was a God's Knight, that seems to imply the God's Knights have their own sense of agency. Like, you could just simply view them as like, we are soldiers of Im sama we are tools of Im sama we are puppets of Im sama we only obey Im sama we do everything in service to Lord Im sama You know, Lord Im sama Lord, Lord Im. <laughs> there you go. But y you know what I mean with that. Like, it, it, that can't be the case if that person was indeed not Shanks. If it was... The, um, uh, Shanks's brother, who was a member of the God's Knights, you know, was like, oh, hello there, Gorosei. I have something to talk to you about. It's about a certain pirate, you know? That seems to imply they're people, okay? And and also, I feel like Oda... Oda's pretty good at, at avoiding that. I mean, I guess there's a few times it's used in the story, but, like, not the, like, we are puppets and we only fight for this one individual. We are conditioned to not have a personality. Like, if Oda's going to introduce a whole new group at this point in the story... He's going to give them a personality. He's not just going to make them blind soldiers, you know what I mean? But still, they might only take direct fighting orders from Eam. Um, that dude, we saw somebody, like, delivering the message to Eam when Eam was in the Garden of Flowers. And uh, he was like, ah, Eam, it is time. You know, they are ready, or they are, the Gorosei are assembled. You know, I just thought that was just, like, a butler or something. Like, ah, yes, Lord Eam-sama, the Gorosei are here to meet you. That's the only pompous accent I have. But, uh, no, that might have been a member of the God's Knights. That might have been somebody, hey, somebody clearly that knows Eam's existence. So, uh, probably just the Gorosei and God's Knights. And Gorosei and God's Knights are probably closely connected. In, in some way, shape, or form, right? So, um, could be a situation like that, because they didn't get involved when Fisher Tiger attacked, and they definitely didn't in get involved just now when Sabo attacked, so has to be something up with that there. Um, but yeah, overall, I, I think I could see why th their existence would be necessary and why they would need to be strong. Now, in terms of overall power level, uh, this is where it gets difficult. So, my opinion on this, and, and the thing that was making me a little bit you know, question, like, what exactly the, like, what exactly is the point of these God's Knights? Because if you make them too weak, then what's the point? What's the point of introducing them, right? So here's the situation. Like, if you say, oh, each individual member of the God's Knights is on the same level as Rob Lucci. I mean, that's nothing to scoff at. You know, Rob Lucci is certainly far from being one of the weaker characters in this story, but let's say, nine knights that are on the same level as Lucci. I mean, okay, I guess. I mean, all right, cool, yeah, that, that they would be strong. They would be strong. Nine Rob Luchis, but, like, is it really all that impressive? <laughs> no offense against Lucci, but, like, would it really be that impressive to, like, would it really be that necessary to have, like, a whole new group introduced if they were only at that level of power, you know what I mean? Uh, maybe saying that each individual member together is on Yonko level. Maybe, maybe that's going a little bit too far. But um, if they fight, 
in a cohesive unit, like the way that they fight is like all nine of them together in a perfectly uh, organized battle formation. And on that level, they transcend a Yonko. That could be something. Now, of course, you bring up the question, and I, I actually think I can explain this one. The question is, well, if each individual is Yonko level or Admiral level or them together are stronger than Yonko level, then why didn't the Gorosei or Eam just send them to deal with the Yonko? Why bother having Admirals when you have the God's Knights? That kind of stuff. Well, on top of them being the last barrier for the Tenerobito, specifically the last barrier for Eam, despite that being the, the cause, also... You have to understand, the world government has ruled this world for 800 years. Specifically, I believe Eam has ruled the world consistently, you know, for continuity-wise, for 800 years straight, okay? When it comes to the politics of the world, Yonko, warlords, supernovas, revolutionary armies, all these terms, Eam might be on a level where he doesn't even give a shit, or they do not even give a shit. You know what I mean? Eam might have been like, you know, I have seen revolutions come and go, great waves, ripples in the wheat field, blown by the wind. Eam could be this immortal being that has lived for the upwards of a millennium. So it was like, oh, there are some strong pirates down there they call emperors. Eh, I don't care. <laughs> you don't think there were strong pirates 100 years ago, 300 years ago, 600 years ago? Eh. Rocks, eh. Roger, eh. He might be on a level above it all, and he just doesn't care. And the God's Knights are his personal royal guard. He would care if somebody barged into Eam's throne room and posed an actual threat to them, which Eam might not even like. No, no one can pose a threat to me. The only one that could pose a threat to me was Joy Boy, and that was well over 800 years ago now. Now, if a reincarnated Joy Boy, <coughs> Luffy, were to, like, challenge him, maybe then at that point, Eam is like, all right, a good, a, a threat has finally, you know, come into my room. I will now summon the God's Knights to attack, you know, something like that. In other words, the, the government, at the end of the day, is ruled by Eam, and Eam might have not cared, or might have been like, oh, we can use the Yonko. Because this kind of sets up a whole balance of power, like paradigm, you know what I mean? Where it's like you got the Marines, you got the Warlords, and you got the Yonko. And they form this perfect balance in the world, okay? Now, you might say, it's like, well, why bother having pirates? Because pirates cause upheaval and chaos in the world. Yes, but from Eam's perspective, that chaos the pirates introduce might either be beneficial to Eam in the long run, keeps the masses distracted, if nothing else, and or it might be just part of Eam's master plan. Like, Eam has a plan, and the Yonko and this balance of power and everything are just necessary, so just allow it. You know what I mean? What if Eam had the power in their back pocket all along to just like, oh, yes, I could summon the God's Knights anytime I want, and I could have wiped out the Yonko, I could have wiped out the Admirals, I can wipe out whoever, but, eh, there's no point. Just let the, let the politics of the lower world sort itself out. I'm up here, I'm on my throne, I'm the ruler of the world, so... Eam is so far above it all, you know what I mean? Now, that might be the hubris that will eventually lead to their downfall, you know, if Luffy ev ever ends up actually directly confronting Eam. That's another thing, too. Uh, from what we see in the silhouettes in the chapter, we have nine silhouettes of the God's Knights. Nine plus Eam would be ten. Ten Straw Hats. You know, I assumed it was going to be the Blackbeard Pirates versus the Straw Hats as the final battle. It it might be the Blackbeard Pirates versus the Straw Hats, and then they have to go and, and, and Straw Hats have to fight against Eam and the God's Knights. It might be something like that. Oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. All right. This would probably never happen. But if Oda ever did this, in a way that made sense. There, he would have to be a really good writer to pull this off. But if he could, though, if he could... What if Blackbeard Pirates and the Straw Hat Pirates fight against one another? Okay. And then they have to team up and fight against the God's Knights. 
Because that would sort of subvert all expectations, where it's like, oh, Zoro has to fight Shiryu. Van Auger has to fight Usopp. It's so obvious. Yeah, they could still do that, but then it's Shiryu and Zoro fighting against a God's Knight. Auger and Usopp versus a God's Knight that specializes in, like, long-range combat or something. Luffy and Blackbeard having to fight together. Now, the fascinating thing with that is Luffy and Luffy would, of course, never want to do that because Blackbeard's the one, obviously, that brought Ace in to be executed and everything like that and killed Whitebeard and all that stuff, right? So, obviously, Luffy would not want to fight with Blackbeard. But Luffy and Blackbeard's personalities, and I did a whole video on this, like the dichotomy, like light and dark, but their personalities are very similar, okay? There's differences, and those key differences are kind of like shown in their first meeting at Jaya when Luffy really hates the cherry pie and, you know, um, Blackbeard really loves the cherry pie. I'll tell you what, the symbolism of that cherry pie at Terry's Pub back in Jaya, you know, that was a lot in that cherry pie, right? I, I'm just saying, but there are similarities there. You know, like, there's not, it's not like, like, Blackbeard is like negative Luffy or something. Like, haha, Luffy, I stand against everything you stand for. No, I mean, there's similarities there. So them fighting together, especially since you have Luffy, Drums of Liberation, the Sun God, Blackbeard representing the moon, the darkness. Them fighting against each other makes perfect sense, but them fighting alongside one another against a common threat, like Blackbeard, Luffy versus Eam? Holy shit, right? Yeah, that would be cool as hell to see. Oh, man, yeah. All right, well, anyway, I'll leave you on that note. I'll leave you on that note. I actually had so many more. I had a whole bunch of... I'm not even going to do it. Separate video. There's a separate video where I actually sit down and talk about the potential abilities that the God's Knights would have. And I wrote all that down here. Um, but I figured this was going to have to be broken up into two videos just for that reason. Probably three, because we've yet to really delve into the... I'm going to do a whole video on the Figarland family. I'm going to do a video. It's going to involve Uta and Shanks and Shanks' brother or whatever. We're going to talk about that a little bit as well. So so there's still more stuff to come, absolutely. Um, but um, before all that, we got to get into uh, uh, Urchin Facts. Yes, we'll end it out with Urchin Facts. We got an intro on this one very quickly. This is from Tori. And uh, Tori also sent me their Spotify link. They do some lo-fi stuff on there. So if you're a fan of lo-fi, uh, check out the link below to their Spotify. And uh, let's go to those Urchin Facts. Urchin Facts. Do -do -do. Urchin Facts. Do -do -do. Urchin Facts. Do -do -do. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Urchins. Oh, my God. Urchins are really cool, guys. Okay. This is uh, not a specific fact about urchins in terms of, like, a species or anything like that. And you know what? A lot of people were fascinated with the urchins. A lot of people were like, wow, this is so cool. I'm actually invested in this. You know what I mean? Excuse me. But, okay, so this is the cool thing, and it's, it's adorable, too. So did you know urchins um, like to put seashells or rocks on top of them? So they have their spines, which are little tubular things that literally, uh, it's similar to the way that a sea cucumber or a starfish moves, where it like it absorbs water and then kind of propels it like a sea cucumber will take in water and then propel it out to actually have a, a form of locomotion. Okay, well, it's like that with sea cucumbers. They have those, I mean, I'm sea uh, urchins because they have the little spines and little suction cups at the end of their spines and they can take in water and they propel it, right? Well, for whatever reason, they like to pick up rocks or seashells and put them on top of themselves. Maybe as added protection or camouflage against predators or anything like that. But the fascinating thing is, biologists and people figured this out. So it doesn't have to be a seashell or a rock. It can be anything. So, for example, you could make a replica of a little hat, like a cowboy hat or a crown, and you could put it next to a sea urchin. And they'll put them on like a hat. <laughs> this is the greatest animal that has ever existed. It has mastered the power of hats. <laughs> oh, and I'm a man that loves his funny hats. Hold on a moment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, look, Clint, like, it's 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 if if there's anybody out there that can that can respect the just the inherent hilarity of a funny hat. It's me, okay? So, this is the one animal out there that has figured out hats. Congratulations, urchins. Congratulations. This is going to be a fun animal fact. All right, thanks for watching, everybody. Later. Signing out.